Welcome to Breakdown to Breakthrough. I am Janie Morris and I am absolutely delighted to have your company for this, the first episode in our brand new series of our podcast, Breakdown to Breakthrough. As a part of transforming now together's um, intention and vision of supporting everybody through me bringing to you some incredible individuals from around the world who have got a great story to tell and my very special guest today is the perfect choice for our first episode in this brand new series because his story is not only, as far as I'm concerned, inspirational, it's motivational and it also feeds into an, a space that I am now moving into personally, which is I call myself now an advocate for unity. And the reason that I do that, most of you who um, who have been following me for the last few years, you know that I have come out of a massively horrific domestic abuse situation. And of course, I've been sharing all of that journey with everybody and being a very strong advocate for women in that space. But one of the most important things that I learned throughout all of that is it's the only way that we're going to get any solutions is if we unite us all, men and women. And so that's where I'm going. I'm an advocate for unity. And Michael Ray of Ray Productions, I reckon you are too. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jane. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Now, I have been stalking you on social media because you are, you've, what I've seen of your story, Michael, um, is what I've sort of started to see in most communities of the emerging focus on fathers and dads that are wanting to navigate their way through all of this stuff that's going on around the world to be stronger, better and happier dads and men in general. Um, you at the age of 49 became a dad. Um, am, I, am I right? It's the very first time that you became a dad at 49. Was that right? Yeah, it took, took me a while to actually find a girl who would lower her standards to <laughs> have someone like me. Michael, you became a dad at 49 and then you became a, a solo dad at 51. So share with everybody a little bit about you. Um, I grew up in a typical heteronormative standard um, family where dad worked, mum ran the household, it worked beautifully. They married all their lives until dad passed. They raised three kids, two of them turned out okay and, and then there was me. Um, I went into a hyper-masculine world of strength and conditioning. I was a bodyguard for just about every rock star that came through Melbourne in the uh, 80s and, and 90s. Everyone from Bon Jovi through to Whitney Houston was was uh, in my in my care at some stage. Um, so pretty blokey blokey. Got to 49, thought children had passed me by, but always loved kids. If there was a party, I, I was the biggest kid surrounded by kids. Um, I worked as a swim teacher for many years as well. So always had an affinity for kids, but just thought it um, had gone past me at that age. Short-term relationship. Suddenly I'm a dad at 49 and realised how completely unprepared I was after growing up in a world that said only a mother's love, maternal instinct, mother knows best. And then we've got Homer Simpson and Fred Flintstone and Al Bundy and all of those um, media depictions of men as uh, basically buffoons and man-child sort of thing and caused me to doubt myself uh, usually. Fortunately, um, my daughter's mother had uh, three children from a previous marriage. So I thought, you know, at least experience-wise, I should be right as long as I just defer to and do as mum says. But that didn't sit quite right with me and I wanted to be um, more hands-on and um, do things a little bit my way. I had that inkling that um, it, it just it wasn't fulfilling enough. And after all those years without a child, I wanted to be the lead parent. Suddenly, all of the stuff that I thought was important to me, uh, career and possessions and, you know, a bit of notoriety wasn't that important. I wanted nothing more than to be a stay at home dad. But um, unfortunately, workplaces back then, especially for males, are some of the least family friendly. 
And so I just started to realize how the barriers were. Then when I became a sole parent, Charlie's mum stepped out of Charlie's life just before her second birthday, and it was just me and her. Um, Charlie's mum's had no contact with her since just before her second birthday. And suddenly you realize after being challenged and abused for using parents' room because you're a bloke, um, I was barred from assisting my daughter backstage at a four-year-old ballet concert. All of a sudden you realize gee, it, it's all very well to say men need to step up, but until we acknowledge, understand, and then address the significant structural, systematic, social, and even personal barriers like um, I had, I doubted myself hugely. I just honestly believe that uh, women had that secret source. They just knew. But since all of those years sitting in the hallway at ballet concerts, getting to speak with mums, not only as a um, peer, but also as an observer, mums suffer the same doubt and um, hesitation or all those things. But women hesitate to reach out because of that um, unfair pressure that they feel where they're meant to just know this stuff. They, a, lot, a lot of the times so they won't reach out until it's a crisis point. Whereas as a bloke, I was consciously incompetent. So I had no problem saying, what should I do? How can I help? And the amazing, my mum tribe around me, they, they were so forthcoming. But I realised then that, gee, I was always told dad's parent differently to mum's. Well, I can tell you now that mum's parent differently to mum's because the advice I was getting from mum's was as diverse some of it was good, some of it not so good, because a lot of it doesn't take into account the unique characteristics of our own children. So what will work with one child, and speaking with mums who have multiple children, one child gets parent parented different to another child because one approach will work with one and not with another. But then it made me realise, gee, all of this stuff we put down to gender, it, it needs to go out the window. We need to throw it in the rubbish bin of history. A lot of it comes down to situation, circumstance, values and characters. So this toxic masculinity can get in the bin. You don't have a problem with your masculinity. You've got a problem with your values and character. If you're behaving like a bit of a, you know, I hate to say it, a bit of a knob, just, you know, it, it's got nothing to do with you being a bloke. It's got, you, you know, you've got a problem with your values and character. So that, that's that's how we became the uh, advocate and wrote a book and just all of these realizations that came in that the world wasn't how I imagined it to be. Reality was a lot different than that stereotype that I'd painted everyone with. It's really interesting that, uh, you know, the, in what you say there, Michael, in regards to the diverse, the diverse advice um, and um, support that, you know, the other mums in the mums club were giving you. Because I think one of the, would you agree that one of the things that um, many, uh, and, I, and I will do it to mothers at this point, I'm a mum and I'm a grandma um, as well, is that um, we, all, we, all make, we all make the same statement. We weren't given a book on how to do this, you know. All of a sudden, especially when it's your first child, you know, um, every most women most women say once they've given birth to their first child, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And you know, there's all this different advice, but there's not there's not a handbook on how to to do it, especially in the beginning. So for you as a single dad, getting all of that, um, all of those different messages of support and what have you, that must have impacted it even more and more. And is that why you uh, decided to write the book? The book, by the way, was, uh, no, if I've got this right, who knew from bouncing and barbells to ballet and braids, is that right? Yep, that, that, that's it, Janie. And um, yeah, exactly right. And um, I've gone on to study developmental psychology because I got that far into it. And even within that in my first semester of developmental psychology fathers weren't mentioned in any meaningful way everything was the baby will hold the mother's gaze the baby will turn towards the sound of the mother's voice mother's this there were even studies cited within my first semester that had over 2000 what they said parents in the cohort without one father and so is it any wonder why everything gets dumped on on mum and so my lecturers kept getting sick of me I'm sure I could see their eyes roll every time it'd be 
should that be parent rather than mother? Yes, Michael, it should. Well, it should say, yeah, you, you're right, Michael, but, you know, it, let's just move on. And so dads are pro portrayed as um, less important and less vital, but it adds so much pressure to mums. It happens in the workplaces as well. So we've got this um, drawing to opposite ends of the scale. A mum will have a baby, so work to support mum often will go, right, well, we'll give her less um, responsibilities. We'll cut back on her hours so she can be a better mum. And with dad, they go, well, for him to be a better dad, we'll give him more opportunities, a few more hours so he can earn a bit more money for the family. And without actually... Um, treating everyone as parents and going, well, dad needs to have some of the responsibilities moved. Mum needs to earn a bit more money. You know, it, it, it depends on who's fulfilling which role within that family and all families. The United Nations said it's great. You know, the family is a fundamental unit of society and the, and the development and the um, place where children develop and needs to be supported regardless. And now we've got the wonderful diversity of two dads and two mums and step adoptive foster grandparents all raising kids are all parents and they all need whatever support is unique and specific for their situation and circumstance regardless you know the uh, you mentioned before the 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 stereotype and we sort of um you know i mean you know for me as a as a, as a baby boomer i can only go back a certain time right um but you know growing up for me it was like that it was like you know mum looks after the kids dad goes out to work and that was just that was it you know that situation i ended up uh, grew up with a single uh, mother at the uh, i was at the age of four when dad left back in the baby boomer days which wasn't the norm you know people people didn't break up you know there weren't divorces and things like that and so mum had to go back to work but then you move into where we are now and there's so there are, the conversations are out there so much about um you know women wanting to have their rightly so their independence be able to choose if they want to go back to work and how that model looks and what have you and the conversation that you're bringing into this, which I believe is incredibly powerful, Michael, with what you're doing here, is, is you're actually raising the contribution to that conversation of saying, well, yes, we all, we all support that and we all agree with that and that will change the stereotype. So let us guys do that. Let it, you know, give us the resources, help us, like help us be the ones that we want to step up. And, you know, you go to work and I'll stay home and be, I'll be dad, you know, and I'll, I'll pick the kids up from school. Um, do you think that, is that, is that a struggle? Is, is that a, re a possibility? Um, do that? 100% Janie, what's happened is women's hard fought um, opportunities now that exist, from the 1970s on, everything from the equal pay. Um, marriage used to be a thing where you basically had to do it and depend on men financially. So there was a lot of um, impotence to get married, to be financially secure and bring up a family. Now women can do this on their own, but they don't. But until men are enabled, encouraged, and finally we move forward with the expectation that they are equally responsible and more than capable to raise the next generation. Women's equality simply won't happen. We wonder why women um, are suffering burnout because all we've done is gone, great, here's all these opportunities outside of the home. You can now take advantage of your um, university degree that you had instead of stepping out of the workforce when you have children to raise those children instead of stepping out when to raise those children now you can do all this stuff because we're going to give you flexible work we're going to make all of these um opportunities a little bit easier for you to grasp mm. but you still got to raise the kids because we haven't enabled dad to step out of the workforce and into the home so you know that's why i say to grasp those opportunities with both hands when he's still carrying the caring load that's why this burnout, and that's why I feel we've only had one oar in the water. Because when I say to guys, I speak to a lot of organisations across the globe, 
do you support women's equality? Of course, I'm fair, I'm progressive thinking, of course they should. What are you doing to support it? What do you mean? And it's an enthusiastic bystander is still a bystander or a supportive bystander. Until men step back a little bit or we have that discussion, until men are happy to go, you know what? My boss is a bit of a prick. I don't really enjoy what I'm doing. I love my kids to death. The gender pay gap is a problem because it's, well, I earn, you know, that 13 or 14% more than you, so it makes us hard financially. But, gee, if you earned as much as I did, so, boys, the gender pay gap affects us, mm. I'd be happy to step out and raise the kids because, you know, I don't really find fulfilment in my job the way I do with the kids. And guess what? Michael says that we blokes are just as capable of raising these kids. We're just as nurturing and it actually rewires your brain and as you mentioned earlier about domestic violence i honestly believe Janie, if we want more caring emotionally and empathetically intelligent men we've got to provide them with more opportunities to care because it literally rewires your brain through that magic neuroplasticity our hormones change when we have kids it explains some of the dad bod apart from the chocolate but you know everything we change it I keep trying to say to guys, if you had have told me I'd be the person I am now after 11 years with my daughter, I would have laughed at you. But I also say to them, I don't believe becoming a father changed who I was. It actually revealed who I really am. And all of the stuff that used to be important, all of the male bravado and, you know, uh, you know, half my arms hanging off, you know, stitches in my ah. It's up now it's oh my goodness if I hurt my knee in the gym I won't be able to run around with my daughter or hit the pool or so you know now I'm more nervous for me because how it may impact my daughter so all of the maladaptive behaviors to the drinking more than the other blokes the out partying you know the working 80 hours all of those things just don't matter to me anymore Janie it's all about how will this impact my daughter because I and I don't mean to sound um soppy but there's nothing that happens outside of the home that isn't made instantly better when i get back into the home and hear my kid dad you know tell me everything that happened and that's why i say to guys you know there's stuff you're focusing on this extrinsic stuff your your reputation what people think of you and all the rest of it there's only one one people one group of people that matter and that's your family what they think of you yeah, well, well said, Michael. And I think it's really interesting and, and touching back on the fact that you did become uh, a father at a later age, at 49. Um, uh, one, of, one of my sons actually became, uh, he was 41 when he had my grandson. Um, and I see, as I'm listening to you, I'm being a little bit self-indulgent here. I'm, uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about my son with his son and i see i see what you're saying because he's he applies that with his son as well so the question the reason i'm sharing that with you is the question to you with all of the with all of the um speaking engagements that you do and the people that you've come across uh in particularly men um do you think that having a child at an older age has actually equipped you better mentally and emotionally to, uh, I, I know you, you became a single dad, but mentally and emotionally to forge that path for the two of you rather than, you know, if perhaps you had have had the child when you were in your 20s, for instance. Mm, it's friends? always a very interesting question, Janie. Um, I'd had... I'd lived a life of excess when I was younger, traveling the world with these rock stars, you know, strength and conditioning coach for elite level athletes. I've trained some Olympians, so I was an AFL strength. And so I had a lot of fun when I was younger and none of that stuff, um, I don't regret it, but none of that stuff is actually important to me. So I was really fortunate, my situation and circumstance, it just happened to click in it right. And I was able to go, you know what? I'm going to work, but I was also um, fairly sick when um, Charlie's mum and I separated and my future wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. And suddenly when the doctor gave me the news, um, it was like my life had become a house that I built and furnished and filled with everything. 
and suddenly it was on fire and there was flames leaping through the roof and smoke going out through the window. And suddenly I was forced to sit there and think, what am I prepared to run back into that house or that life to try and uh, rescue or salvage? And the only thing that came to me in that moment was what impact this was going to have on my daughter. She was nine months old at the time. And suddenly I was told, you know, your future's not guaranteed. You got some hard yards in front of you. And um, that was the only thing is what memories would my daughter um, have with me to carry through life? Would she even remember me? And I remember one day in hospital, I was going through some pretty horrific treatment. And I said to the nurse, you know, I don't even know if this is worth it. And that nurse said to me, one day you'll be taking your daughter to Disneyland and this will be nothing but a, a, a bump in the bump in the road. And I said, oh, I doubt it. And the way life works, I ended up writing a story for Disney on their Babel parenting website. And they said to me, would you like tickets to Disneyland anywhere in the world? Because um, the story went off and we ended up walking into Hong Kong um, Disneyland. I think it was four years after the nurse uh, said five years. So Charlie was almost six and we got into Disneyland and I lost it, Janie. I'm standing there crying that hard that I had strangers coming up saying to me, are you okay? Have you lost your child? And I said, no, I'm just happy. <laughs> it's, you know, Charlie said, Dad, what's wrong? Said, oh, but I'm just so happy. And yeah, so I still tear up about it now. So right place, right time. But it, it's also just about embracing and keeping your eye on the ball. There are lots of things we don't have, but gee, when you focus on what you do, it's just, it, it's a great life. You know, if we all do a treasure hunt on our lives, there's a lot of stuff we find. Oh, I love that. Oh, treasure hunt on your life. I like that. That is that is a really good statement right there. To, uh, can, can we talk a little bit about Charlie before we let you go? Yes, of course. Oh my God, <laughs> How old is Charlie now? Uh, she's 11 going on 33. Yeah, there you go. She's a girl. <laughs> Wait until she, the eve of her 13th birthday, Michael. Remember that night because my girlfriends tell me, because I'm not a mother of a daughter, my uh, my children are uh, all boys uh, or men, um, but apparently on the eve of any girl's 13th birthday, something happens and the next day you do not recognise them at all. <laughs> so um. <laughs> cherish the next two years. Um, uh, now, Charlie, you've co-written a book with Charlie. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, Danny, the first book that I wrote, uh, the uh, Barbell, who knew, I wrote that during our first lockdown here in Victoria, which, which was a fairly long one because I had to sit next to Charlie while she was doing a homeschooling. So at that stage, I was doing a lot of talks in the UK um, to different organisations and uh started writing the book and Charlie watched it. And during the second lockdown, she said, Dad, why don't I write a book? And she wrote a book. It's called A Step in the Right Direction. And it's a rhyming book about her experience as a daughter of a, a solo dad, because a lot of the stuff, um, we've got this saying, we bugger that. And anything that doesn't make sense to her or is a little bit sexist or gendered, you know, say to, you know, when they say, oh, Girls don't hit. Charlie loves boxing. Girls don't hit hard. So, Charlie, what do you think about it? Bugger that, Dan. You know, Charlie holds an Australian powerlifting record. Um, yeah, so it really is that monkey see, monkey do. So we found a great website that uh, rhymes words. So she would write it and then she would go through and find the words. But in the book, there's also a little spider because what we do is we scare each other with black rubber spiders every chance we get. We leave them lying around. <laughs> So on every page is a spider. But Charlie noticed one day when we are in the supermarket and she said, Dad, why are there no pictures of boys on any of the packets? I said, do you? I didn't notice. So we walked every aisle in the supermarket. We found 28 products with people on the packaging. And out of that 28 products, only three had men on it. There was Mr. Sheen, Mr. Muscle, and a really cool looking dad with dreadlocks on an organic uh, nappy thing. So everything from... Uh, washing powder to, you know, detergent, uh, cake mixes, cooking mixes, baby products, all have women on it. So at eight years old, at that stage she was, my daughter's being told that domestic duties and the domestic sphere, that's your world. And that's another one where we say, 
bugger that. And Charlie's forever writing letters off to someone. You've got a woman on on this product. Why don't you have a man on it as well? And you know, she's she's right onto it now. But again, it's the environment because she's always told, you know, who did your hair? Dad did. Oh, I knew ways. Charlie actually said to the woman, she's gone. It's a ponytail. He didn't cure cancer. <laughs> but I had to go off and have lessons to to do this journey because I'd never had any experience. And when dad said to me, I can't do it. And I said, well, how much stuff at work when you first got promoted into your position couldn't you do that you learn? If it's important to your kids, learn it. Like we don't come pretty wide with this. The reason your wife can do it is because she grew up doing her own hair. No one expects you just to be able to go, it's a French braid and off you go. Learn it. It's worthwhile and it's a skill. So what what um what an incredible relationship the two of you ha have. And if I may say, um what what an incredible life the two of you have been gifted together because not just individually, and I'm sure that my audience will agree with this, what I say to them now, listening to just a snippet of your story today, Michael, both individually and collectively with your gorgeous Charlie, um, you, you have brought to all of us today an insight of can do and an insight of why not us as well and uh i think i feel strongly that from what you've shared with us today and if i may be so bold i would love to have both you and charlie at some stage on together if we can on on one of our podcasts which is behind the book we'd love to talk to charlie about her book um but but what i want to say to you is this michael today is that from what we have heard, what you have shared, um, your transparency in your life and, and, and what you've so far been going through over the last 11 years in an enlightening way um, gives, gives people hope that, and you rightly, you rightly pointed out before, there is so much about um, uh, women's rights, rightfully so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm strong on that, obviously, um, women's right and, and gender equality and, and of course the gender pay gap and, you know, fill in, fill in the gap of all those things. And they're all equally as important, but the bringing up of the importance of men in the solution of those issues and then the bring uniting of both men and women that's the real story that's the real conversation and that's what we all should be doing especially for the generations coming up behind us the younger generations if we can break the cycle with with conversations like you are constantly having you and charlie are demonstrating to others um then those stereotypes breaking those down don't don't would you agree that that that's the solution that's what gives us hope for the future generations 100 percent, Jane. I, I did a post that went into the millions on linkedin and it's just was called the power of and so when we talk about um the, the gender struggles we have you know there's the motherhood penalty where we know that it can take up to 12 years for a mum to regain her career trajectory and earnings from when we have a children but it should be the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood forfeit. So fathers forfeit those unique, irreplaceable moments, those first, the the you know, the school performances, the school sports days, being at the child's bedside when they're sick because they're locked into that breadwinner role. You know, there's um and, and children benefit as well. So women, men, children are all hurt by this outdated gender expectations and stereotypes. There's the uh, Workplace Gender Equity um, Organisation in Australia reports that while 70%, 70% of Australian workplaces now have a, a set policy for work engagement and flexible work, less than 2% have set targets for men's engagement. So the school rings. Bub's going to be off sick for a couple of days. 
wife's is in the 70 percent that does have flexible working uh arrangements dad's is in the 98 percent that doesn't that's not a gender problem. That's a structural and systematic problem that we've created by only having one oar in the water going, we've got to help mothers to be able to work and care. And we haven't gone, parents, it's parents, step, adoptive, foster, same-sex, birthing, non, whatever you want to call them or label them, grandparents, they're parents that are parenting. And for some reason, parenting seems to be the last bastion of contemporary society where we don't want to go, nope, it's not a chairman, it's a chairperson. No, it's not a male nurse, he's just a nurse. And get rid of it. We've all got the same dreams, hopes, aspirations for our children. We've all got the same concerns. And when I hear, you know, mums talk about the imposter syndrome at work, my goodness, you want to hear that imposter syndrome dads have as far as nurturing children go, I don't know what to do and all the rest of it. We have mansplaining when men interrupt women and say, you know, this is what you need to be. You want to see some of the advice I've been offered over the years, Jane. And like I say, they both come from a well-meaning place, but they're both patronising. You know, that woman is more than capable that you're offering such patronising advice to. And that man is as well. I've sat there halfway through a developmental psychology degree being told about my daughter's emotional well-being and it's, Yep, yep, I'll just be polite. You know, the the mums groups that can be intimidating and for dads and say, oh, you know, they're a bit standoffish. And I go, have you taken the time to talk to mums about how clicky they can be as well? It's not just you. <laughs> it's, you know, like any group. So, you know, it's it flip the coin. It depends on, it's not what you're looking at, but where you're looking from. And, you know, no one wins with these outdated gender expectations. And until fatherhood, is spoken about in the same glowing terms as motherhood. And until we tie our boys as tightly to fatherhood as what we do with our girls to motherhood, not much is going to change. Like It's just, we can all do this. And we, you know, what we think is choice often isn't choice. It's the structures and the systems we've set up where women are doing all the caring and now we need two incomes. So we're going to help them to work. We've built a freeway to the workplace for women and we've got a rickety old staircase hidden behind a, a door that no one knows about for dads back into the home. And we've just gone all, all in on one and none on the other. And until these dads are going, you know what? I don't care about my position, possessions or power. I care about my kids. How fulfilled am I? You know, you look at Google, there are 12,000 people at Google going, how good is this? I've worked my way up at Google next minute. Oh, jeez, <laughs> I don't work at Google anymore, but my family's still there. So, Yeah, it's um, uh, you're absolutely right, Michael. I, and and I not only do I love your passion, but I love what you're doing. Um, and if I can invite you, I think that we would love to have you back on the um, on the podcast again in the future because there are so many other things that I know that um, uh, that we want to ask you in the space that you're now um, advocating and and working in very heavily as well. But also, I'm sure that once. Um, uh, we'll be getting a lot of questions from our audience to ask you as well. So, if, so I'll put that invitation out to you now. Yeah, uh, me and Janie on there. We'd love to have you back on. Michael, before I let you go, question that I always ask my guests, if you had an eight-year-old Michael in front of you right now, what advice would you give him? Oh, don't eat the whole thing probably, given my figure. No, um, it'd just be relax. You know, this whole what are you going to do when you grow up? The, some of the best adventures and some of the best destinations are found by accident. So when you're on that path, I think we, we over schedule, we over plan. And that's what leads to a lot of anxiety because when things don't go, I've got this booked in, I'm going to be here in five years. I'm going to be there in five years. And it's just, as I said, I got to 49. It was always this opportunity. Sure. That sounds like fun. And it's a lot easier and you don't get so far down a track towards something you know, it's that old, you're climbing the ladder, but it's leaning against the wrong building. And that's what it would be. Just relax. 
great advice. Michael, um, we do have all of your contact details below where everybody is listening and watching um, this episode of uh, Breakdown to Breakthrough anyway. But if people wanted to contact you to perhaps have you speak at an event or interview you on their podcasts or, or what have you, how's the best way for them to contact you? Um, I'm fairly prolific on LinkedIn, but the best place is a contact form on my website, michaelray.com.au. Um, I'll always always get back to you through that. And uh, yeah, LinkedIn's probably the, the best though. Fantastic. Michael, it's been our absolute pleasure to have you here as our um, on our first episode of our new series of Breakdown to Breakthrough. Thank you so much. Say hi to Charlie for us. Um, looking forward to having her come on the show at some point in time as well. And uh, congratulations on all you're doing and, and uh, the legacy that you're creating that your girl is going to be very proud of as well. Yeah. And Janie, that's what I say too. Some of the language you use, I'm sacrificing for my kids. My goodness, sacrifice to me denotes that I'm giving up something of greater value for something of lesser value. There were trade-offs, but unless you're a mug and you don't know what you're doing, I've never traded anything that I thought was of greater value. So the stuff that I've given away for the stuff that I've got with Charlie, I'd trade it all day, every day. And I'm the luckiest bloke in the world with this kid. And it's the most fun I've ever had. So you know, it's just a win, win, win. Yeah, no, a absolutely. Congratulations. And thank you again for being our guest today. Thank you, Jane. So if you've enjoyed listening or watching this uh, podcast, video cast, wherever you are in this amazing, beautiful world of ours, um, remember to subscribe at janiemorris.com at the podcast section. All of our podcasts are there um, and you can listen to this one on repeat. But of course, if you're listening to it wherever you get your podcasts and video casts on iTunes, Spotify, um, Apple, any one of those right around the world, uh, then remember to comment, send us questions. If you'd like us to ask Michael some questions when we have him back on the show again, then send those questions through to info at janiemorris.com and we'll make sure that he gets those as well. Um, but for today, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Janie Morris. This is Transforming Now Together. And uh, we would love for you to go to our website, janiemorris.com, subscribe to all the podcasts. Breakdown to Breakthrough is this podcast. And this is our very first episode with our very special guest, Michael Ray. Until I have your company next, wherever you are in this beautiful, amazing world of ours, I hope you have an absolutely fabulous day.